Welcome to Gentlest TensorFlow Intro Part 2. We will take a review of TensorFlow, but this time in illustrations, because we want to emphasize TF the placeholder and feed, as well as the training process. Next, we look at the tensor board, which enables us to visualize cost W and B at each training step. With the review of TensorFlow, it enables us to understand easily what training in different batch sizes mean. First, a quick review. Our goal is, given house size, use machine learning to predict the house price. Without data, we cannot predict anything. So, we collect, or rather, generated some fake data where y, the house price, is always equals to 2 times the house size, x. Then, we model our data using linear regression. We choose linear regression because it is simple, and we want to demonstrate what TensorFlow usage is. So, we tweak the values of W and B in order to find the best linear model that can fit our data. The best fit is defined as a model that can reduce the cost, which are the sum of the blue lines. And the blue lines are just the difference between the actual data point versus the prediction values. Now, with a good fit, we can now, given any house size, give a good prediction of the house price. In a previous video, we model um, TensorFlow. <coughs> we model linear regression in TensorFlow. We have to model the linear regression, which is y equals to w x plus b. We also have to model the cost which is the least squared difference. For ease of understanding, just think of cost as the absolute difference between the predicted value minus the actual value. Y is our prediction. And to get a good prediction, we must have good values of W and B, which we need to train. To get good values for W and B, our goal is then to minimize the cost, which is minimizing the actual house price versus the predicted house price. To do that, we need to do training, which is basically gradient descent. So what is training exactly? Now we start with some values of B and W. We feed them into the TensorFlow graph. Then we take a data point from our data set and feed it into the TensorFlow graph. Now we have values for W, B, as well as an X. This enables us to make a prediction Y. We also have the actual value, which is Y underscore. And now we can calculate the cost, which is the absolute difference between the actual value, y underscore, minus the prediction, y. With the cost, we can now do training, which is gradient descent, to minimize the cost. We will tweak w and b such that they will reduce the cost from the viewpoint or this data point. With better values for W and B, we now update them, and this is exactly one training step. With the new values of W and B, we can fit into the model or the TensorFlow graph and choose a different data point. Again, with the new W and B plus the new X of the next data point, we can predict another 
house price, which is y. And again, with the prediction and the actual house price, we can calculate the cost. So basically, we will just repeat these for n steps or until the cost reaches a value that we are satisfied with. To create TensorFlow Graph, which is basically this thing um, that we circle in red, we have to use tf.variable to store variables that we want to learn or train, in this case w and b. We also have to use tf.placeholder to hold to be placeholders for value that we are going to feed into the TF graph, in this case the actual data points x and y underscore. Now we can model TensorFlow. As you can see, w and b will be defined as tf dot variable. And for w, its dimension is just one by one because it has just one feature and one output. For b, it's only reliant on the one output that we have. Note that to enhance visualization, we also give them names w and b. If we do not provide names, the variables will be assigned random names like variable 0 and variable 1 during visualization. So for our actual data points that we are going to feed into this model, we have to put them as placeholder. And again, x is just has a dimension of 1 because it's just one feature, and y underscore, which is the house, actual house price, also have just one dimension, which is the house price. To enhance visualization, again, we provide names. So in this case, um, to prevent them, to prevent the system from assigning random placeholder names like placeholder 0 and placeholder 1. Next, we are ready to model our linear regression, y equals to wx plus b. However, when we model it, we define it under scope, wx underscore b. With scope, all these definitions will appear as a black box during visualization. This enables us to um, visualize complex graphs easily, as we will see later. We also um, define the cost, and again under the under a scope called cost. And finally, the train step, which we also define under the scope name train. And we have fully defined our linear regression model in TensorFlow. We will now look at TensorBoard. TensorBoard has two basic components that we are going to use. One is summary. So we use summary to mark data that we want to collect and visualize. In this case, W, B, and cost. The writer is an object that is used to actually collect the data and write it into an event file. So to collect data for cost, all we need to define is that a variable and assign it to tf.scalar summary. Now it is scalar summary because cost is single dimension. For W and B, which can be multi-dimension, we use histogram summary to collect data. Before we can use those summaries, we have to do a tf dot merge all summaries. If we do not want to collect, if we want to only collect certain parts of the data or certain variables, then we can also just use tf dot merge summary and provide a list of um, visualizations that we want to collect. The writer is very simple. All you need to do is define as tf dot train summary writer with the directory where data should be collected and an option whether we want to um, collect data to enable TensorFlow or to rather TensorBoard to draw the network graph. With that, for every tra single training step, we can start collecting data. However, that may be too much data. So we can use some modular arithmetic, for instance, to collect data that is, um, to do writer.add summary only every 10 steps as shown here. 
Once we have finished collecting data, we can launch our TensorBot server using the following command, which we just need to point to the log directory where our events are stored and also the port number. We can then launch our browser pointing to the port and we will be able to see the TensorBot. If we click on graph, you can see the uh, graph visu visualization of our TensorFlow linear model. As you can see, we have only three big blocks, wx underscore b, cost, and trade. This is, are the three scopes that we have defined. For each of the scope, for instance, wx underscore b, we can click it to expand it. Now, if we had not defined uh, scopes, what we will see is all these graphs expanded and it will be very difficult to visualize. So in this case, we can see that wx underscore b is actually x, met matrix multiplication by w, and added to b. So why is visualization important? One, is to understand if we have made mistakes, and two, is to understand whether we have found a good fit. In this case, you can look at when we do linear regression with one feature, you can see that the cost drops quickly to zero. When the cost reaches zero, it means that we, can, we have found a good model fit. And you can see that the values of W and B um, is learned within 400 steps. What if we change the value of B? In this case, instead of Y is equals to 2X, we make it Y is equals to 2X plus 10, such that B is equals to 10. In this case, we generate x from 0 to 99 to create 100 data points and the corresponding y to be 2 times of x plus 10 as follows. Now, if we run this, if we try to train this model, you can see that the cost approaches 0 or it appears to reach 0. But if you zoom in, you can see that it is not quite 0. So you have to be aware of the cost axis, which is very huge. So you have to zoom in to discover whether it has actually reached zero. Here you can see that B is still slowly learning. It has not reached the ideal value of 10. But for W, we have reached the ideal value of 2. So the question now is, is there a faster way to learn B? What about using a faster gradient descent learning rate? Or use a different model? Or even use a different cost function? These are the things that you can explore. Next, we will talk about batch size. So what we have done so far is that at each training step, we feed one data point into the TensorFlow graph. This is known as stochastic gradient descent. In mini-batch gradient descent, instead of feeding just one data point, you can actually feed a few data points, which we call a mini-batch. In this case, the mini-batch is three. So the difference is that every time you feed in three data points, when you calculate the cost, this is the cost of the three data points. And also when you do a training step, you are also trying to reduce the cost from the viewpoint of three points in the mini batch, instead of just one when you're using stochastic gradient descent. Finally, batch gradient descent means that we use all data points at each training step. So when we tweak W and B, we are actually considering from the viewpoint of all the data points. Now, so the code, whether you are doing stochastic mini batch or batch gradient descent, is the same. The x that you define as a placeholder does not change, the y underscore does not change, the train step does not change, the feed step does not change, right? When you run, it does not change. The only change are the x and y underscore values that you feed into the train step. Now, if you are asking why do you need to feed in x and y underscore values, you just need to look at the train step. The train step relies on cost. Now, cost, of course, relies on y underscore, which is the actual uh, house price from your data point, and also depends on y, which is the prediction. However, the prediction y depends on w, b, and x. B and X are the values that we are learning, and X actually comes from the actual data point again. So therefore, the train step actually has dependency on X and Y underscore, which are the data points. 
So you need to fit them in. So in stochastic gradient descent, what happens is that all, notice the, um, the, the pink square, which is the part that you just need to change. So each time you're just feeding one data point. For mini batch gradient descent, we're going to generate like a thousand points, and each time we can choose a batch size, for instance, five. And then each training step, we're going to use five different points. And when we reach the end, we can start from the beginning again. So you can see, the only difference now is that the X and Y values we fit in is in batch batches. Also note that when you define a uh, placeholder for X and Y on the score, there is a uh, keyword called none. None means that uh, the size, the batch size is undetermined. So it can be only determined during runtime, which is great. That means you do not need to care, you do not need to make a decision of what's the batch size to use when you're building the model. Finally, batch gradient is same means that in every single step you are using all the points. Again, the only difference in this case is that you do not use a single point, like stochastic uh, gradient descent, you do not use a subset of the points, like mini batch, but rather you use all the data points at each time. So what is the significance of a batch size? Well, as explained earlier, when you are finding, uh, when you are tweaking W and B values to reduce the cost, or rather you are, what you are doing is also finding the steepest gradient descent, you are considering from viewpoints of all the points in that batch. So obviously, when you have batch size 1, it takes faster to compute rather than and rather than when you have a full batch when each step you have to compute the uh, cost and also the best direction or the best gradient steepest gradient descent for full batch you always have to calculate for all points however the outcome okay using the same gradient descent learning rate but different batch sizes you will realize that if we just take 1,000 train steps and batch size is 1, you can see that we have not fully learned um, which are great, uh, learn the good value for W and B yet. As you can see, cost is still decreasing towards 0. When the batch size is 100, yes, we have successfully uh, trained the model because the cost has reduced to 0 and we get values of B and W of 0 and 2 as expected. However, when you have a batch size of 1000, you can see that we also successfully train the model such that the cost reduces to zero and the expected values of B and W reaches to zero and two respectively. But you can see that we could train uh, the cost reduced to zero very quickly because each time we are considering all the different points viewpoints instead of randomly uh, choosing a direction based on a subset of the points. So in summary, when you the best size you use, right, the smaller the best size, the less resource to train each step. But because you are making decision based on only a small number of points, when you have small best sizes, you have to take more steps to, to find good values of W and B. So in other words, choosing a best size really it's a balance. And that's all for now. Thank you very much.